Hey, my name's Chris Hobbs. To some extent, I'm a bit of a fraud here. I mean, my background in safety systems is in safety systems, one part of which is medical. The emphasis of the work I've done in the past has been on things like railway signaling, railway trains, safety systems, uh, industrial automation systems, the safety of or, or industrial automation systems, as well as the safety of medical systems. So yes, I'm going to talk about COTS, commercial off-the-shelf software, and SOUP, either software of uncertain pedigree or software of unknown provenance, um, in the safety industry in general, but medical obviously as, as the emphasis. I notice I've been preempted by a very good article in uh, Meds magazine this week by, from LDRA, and I don't know whether uh, Anil Kumar is here, but uh, it's a very good article in that magazine about cots and soup in uh, medical devices and so on. So thank you, the LDRA people, for that. Really, this presentation is aimed at you. So whoever you are, you are the intended audience for it. The, what I actually want to bring out are really th three points. I see things that are beginning to happen in the medical industry that we've been wrestling with in industrial automation, we've been wrestling with, with railway systems, avia aviation systems and so on for many years. This is the question of complexity. In the past, you know, perhaps 15 years ago, most safety critical devices had a small amount of software in them. The software was running on a, a run to completion, simple executive, probably written by the, the company producing the device. And it was largely deterministic. What I see happening now is, particularly in this sort of area, and increasingly, I think, in the medical area, um, the increasing complexity of what's being asked of the software is really leading us into three areas. The area of functional safety. I do want to just briefly touch on functional safety. Functional safety is of immense importance um, in those other industries I've spoken about. Um, it is less important at the moment in the medical side, but I, I see it coming. The use of COTS, soup, and what we've termed clear soup um, in medical devices, because basically the, that complexity is meaning that we can't handle everything ourselves. We have no company can develop everything. And presenting the evidence. As we move into this additional complexity, the evidence that we're going to need to present to ourselves first of all, are you happy to be hooked up to that medical device? Are you happy to travel on that train with those brakes that you, know, you, you understand how the, the braking system works? To your uh, regulatory body and to your customer, you know, the evidence that needs to be presented is getting much, much more complex. It is no longer just a, um, a process type of uh, evidence. There's going to need to be numerical, statistical evidence about the failure rates and so on. So I'm just going to touch on these briefly. If I can work out how to use this machine, it'll be even briefer. OK, functional safety. I did want just to mention functional safety because it's not something that has, you know, it's in six, 61508. IEC 61508 is, of course, based on functional safety. So if everybody here is absolutely happy with functional safety, look me in the eye and we'll move on. If not, I'll spend a few, okay, right, people avoiding my eyes, I see, yep. Okay, so let's talk briefly about functional safety. Most products whether it's a system for managing robots working in industrial automation roaming across factory floors, or it's a device for measuring blood pressure or whatever, has a function. Its function is, of this, the function of this chainsaw is to cut wood. It does damage to wood, but that's its function. So that's not a problem with safety. However, a chainsaw obviously can chop people's heads off. So we can provide safety to this product in two ways. We can provide some sort of physical barrier that prevents you, you know, if you lift it above your head or something to neck height, it automatically, you know, some piece of mechanics comes in and stops you getting at it. That's not functional safety. That's the sort of safety that we expect to see in any sort of system. Functional safety is some function, some additional function of the product 
that comes into effect when a safety da a danger occurs and it has to operate to keep the system safe. So in the past when systems have been very, very simple, the systems have been demonstrably safe. Now with the increased complexity we have in systems, the systems are not demonstrably safe, as we'll see in a second. We have to provide functionality on the system to keep them safe. And this is where IEC 61508, EN 5012, 68 and 9 and all of its associated uh, specifications, this is what they deal with. So functional safety is uh, something I think that we're going to need more and more in uh, medical devices and it has to be treated separately. This is the main function of this device is to chop wood. The functional safety part of this thing is to ensure that the blade stops within 25 milliseconds if this condition occurs. Functional safety. Both of them have to work. And this is the problem. We have a balance. I've just spent the last four weeks in China working with a company in the railways. Very, you can produce a very, very, very safe railway braking system if you never allow the train to move. You can produce, I'm sure, a very, very safe drug infusion system if you never allow it to infuse any drug. It moves perpetually to its design safe state. But we have to have a balance now between the safety functions and the actual functions of the device. Trains that don't move are not very useful in terms of railway systems. So functional safety. We have plethora of standards, as has been mentioned earlier, in terms of regulation and what have you. And most of these standards, but funnily enough not the medical ones yet, tend to define the concept of a safety integrity level as a probability of, fail probability of a dangerous failure or, or whatever per hour of operation. And yeah, five nines we can forget about. I think we all know that five nines is a million failures of 316 microseconds each is possibly benign. A failure of 15 minutes may be catastrophic. I want to go back to really fundamental question. My, my interest, my knowledge, my experience is in the area of software safety. And more and more software, more and more complexity is being put into more and more devices. So the very good question is what is software? You know, if you've got something in an FPGA, is that software? If you've got an ASIC designed by, a, by software, is that software? You know, what, where does software start? Where does software end? The um, railway people, again, sorry to keep going back to railway rather than medical people here, but I haven't found an equivalent in the medical area. The railway people have a very pragmatic definition of what's software. If you can test it completely, it's not software. If you can do exhaustive testing, it's hardware. So basically, that's going. Now, you've got to be a bit careful here. Obviously, you can't exhaustively test a RAM chip, for example, but you can do that by demonstration of, of, uh, uh, of the design or whatever. So basically, software cannot be 100% tested. Why not? Because what do we have today? We have multi threaded software. We have Heisenbugs caused by threads interacting and re-interacting. They are unre what, we, what the test people tend to call unreproducible errors that um, caused by race conditions, timing, subtle timing conditions that come and go. Test people cannot cope with them. First of all, because they're not observable. You cannot observe the conditions that caused that, that, that combination of threads to occur in precisely that timing sequence. And secondly, even if they were observable, they're not reproducible. You can't set that situation up and run it again. So from testing point of view, it's, it's effectively as though the system were indeterminate. This is an example I use when I give my course on, 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 on this, is, is, is a, um, lift, a system of a lift. It was someone in North America put the slide together and called it something called an elevator. I'm not sure. Anyway, it's a lift system. Three lifts in a, an hotel and we, we do a safe, I do a safety course where we prove using linear temporal logic that given an algorithm and here's part of it, that a lift door can never be open unless the lift is at that floor. So basically the, the system is safe. 
that we can, that, you know, that's what we prove. And then, unfortunately, there's a flaw in this design. You can't see it here because not quite enough of the design is there, but there's a flaw. The design allows the system never to open a lift door. So again, we have a perf, and, and, and I point this out to the students after they've said, yep, this is a great system, this really works, it works well, and what have you. But again, we have this distinction between, we have a perfectly safe system. The system never um, gets into a dangerous state of opening the door when the lift is not there. Unfortunately, it's a completely useless system because the lift will just go up and down, up and down, and up and down, and there's no requirement in the requirements that the doors will ever open. So again, we have this balance between functional requirements and functional safety requirements that are being met. Non-deterministic systems, everybody's going to say that all computer systems, particularly software, is deterministic. And absolutely right. You know, short of a cosmic ray hitting a, uh, a memory chip somewhere, the software is deterministic. If you run the same thing twice, you'll get exactly the same conditions. Software does not wear out. Unfortunately, for any sufficiently um, complex system, you can never run the same conditions twice. As soon as you get multi-threading into that system, multi-processing, as soon as you get interrupts that can be handled in slightly different orders depending on timing, you can never reproduce the same circumstances. To all intents and purposes, the number of states of the system is infinite. And therefore, you cannot do 100% testing. So, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to develop our products. We're going to have the normal three th conditions, <coughs> quality, features, and delivery date that play against each other. As we all know, management gets to choose two. The engineers get to choose the other one. It doesn't matter really which ones the management choose and which ones the engineer chooses. That's fine. And we have our choice. We can roll our own solution, or we can use something off the shelf. And this is what I really wanted to get into today.